Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is John Kieran. I'm president of the New York City Bar Association, and it's just a huge pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to the, the, this evening's uh, discussion of the fascinating issue of whether and to what extent limitations can be placed uh, uh, justifiably on hate speech. Uh, the, the clash of values that, uh, uh, that uh, underlies discussions of these issues is striking. Uh, not least because uh, it tends so often uh, to cause people whose political orientations are otherwise very similar to find themselves on very different sides of the issue. Uh, the value of decrying hate speech, of believing that right-thinking people shouldn't have to, uh, should be able to insulate themselves from having to tolerate hearing it and viewing some of its worst manifestations as crossing the line uh, from protectable speech into a form of conduct uh, that should be prohibited for the uh, advancement of, of uh, safety and order uh, seems strong. Uh, so does the value of believing that the freedom of speech uh, is most important and most in need of protection uh, when the speech includes statements that some find uh, deeply offensive, uh, that trying to regulate speech based on offensiveness heads us down a road that we should not travel as a nation, and that a core component of the American consciousness is the conviction that the proper remedy for offensive speech is not forced silence, but more speech uh, of you voicing the other side of the debate. <clears throat> we could hardly have a better panel uh, to help us wrestle through uh, these competing values and the issues they pose than the folks here tonight. Uh, their status as leaders in this area entitles them to uh, uh, what we will provide them in the interest of time, which is the respect of a greatly foreshortened bi biography, because you probably know who they are so well already. If you don't, I encourage you to look them up uh, and confirm that they represent the very top of the profession uh, on this subject. So here goes the speed dating version of uh, 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 the bios of tonight's panelists, starting with our moderator, Jamal Green. Uh, Jamal Green uh, is the Dwight Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. His scholarship and teaching focuses on the structure of legal and constitutional argument. Uh, our panel, in alphabetical order, which will mean bouncing back and uh, forth, Alex Abdo is a senior staff attorney at the Knight First Amendment Institute. He's been at the forefront of litigation relating to NSA surveillance, encryption, anonymous speech online, uh, and government transparency. Uh, Floyd Abrams, uh, can legit of Cahill, Gordon, and Rindell, uh, can legitimately be characterized as the leading First Amendment advocate of our time. Uh, he has argued many times in the Supreme Court on behalf of major media and news outlets and others on the leading issues implicating First Amendment rights. Uh, his representations include famously the representation of the New York Times in the Pentagon Papers case uh, and uh, his amicus curiae representation of Senator Mitch McConnell in the Citizens United case and too many others to be able to note in this short time available to us. Uh, Dan Kornstein, Dan, is an accomplished trial and appellate lawyer who's conducted over 100 trials and similar adversarial proceedings and argued more than 80 appeals. He's litigated several notable First Amendment cases and filed an amicus brief in the recent Supreme Court case involving the trademark of the, of the name The Slants. Uh, his book on Oliver Wendell Holmes, entitled The Second Greatest American, has just recently been published, is on my night table and should be on yours too. Uh, uh, Carmelin Malalas was appointed uh, chair and commissioner of the New York City Commission on Human Rights uh, uh, by Mayor de Blasio in November 2014. And she's set about revitalizing the agency in all respects. Before that, Carmelin was a partner and practice group head at Outen and Go Goldman LLP, where she litigated uh, discrimination cases. Uh, we're also delighted that uh, Carmelin is a member of our uh, executive committee here at the City Bar Association. Nadine Strassen uh, is the John Marshall Harland II uh, Professor of Law at New York Law School from 1991 through, 19, through 2008. She served as president of the American Civil Liberties Union, the first woman to head the organization, uh, 
Uh, I would waive Nadine's forthcoming book, but it is still forthcoming. It will be out in a, uh, April 2018, uh, entitled Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship, which may give you a sense of a, a little of her sensibilities on this. Um, uh, and we look forward to receiving it. Now, so, they, so it's a, just a pleasure to be able to pre present this group of experts to you. Just one word on, on uh, how we're going to uh, march through the evening. After some introductory remarks, Jamal is going to, uh, to uh, manage a panel discussion, and we're going to save about 20 minutes for questions at the end. What we'd like to do in the interest of making the, the question and answer period as effective as possible is ask people to put together questions on index cards. Please limit yourself to one question. Please try to define a question as a single sentence that ends with a question mark, <laughs> uh, which is sometimes a challenge for us lawyers. Uh, and uh, Jamal will sort through them. Uh, if you have an index card, wave it, and somebody will come receive it. And Jam uh, uh, Jamal will sort through them and try to make uh, the question and answer period as effective for the group as possible. So with that, uh, thanks very much for coming. And let me give you Jamal Green. Bear with me while I lower the podium so now we can all see each other. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm mindful, I should say, that a part of our, our obligation is to be lively enough to keep you from checking your phones uh, for the scores of the baseball game. So uh, we're going to try to do that uh, as best uh, we can. And I, I kind of want to start, uh, in, really, in, this, in that spirit. Uh, not by having uh, our panelists all give a statement, but really just to, to launch into uh, some background and some questions um, so we can get into a nice discussion. Uh, you see on the sides of the panel uh, the, the text of the First Amendment. Uh, it's, of course, uh, of course, if that were sufficient, uh, we wouldn't need to be here. Uh, that doesn't, the text of the First Amendment doesn't tell us very much, and in fact, it's misleading, um, since it starts with Congress and uh, also says, shall make no law. And so one of the questions we'll be asking is, is the, the degree to which um, that's actually true to our uh, traditions and our experience. Uh, so I wanna, I wanna start by just kind of making sure that we're all speaking the same language and all have a basic sense of, uh, of where the Supreme Court uh, and uh, US case law is on the relationship between freedom of speech and what we often refer to uh, as hate speech. Uh, and I thought I would uh, turn to uh, Daniel Kornstein uh, to just give us just a few minutes of uh, what, the, what the kind of big cases uh, are in this area and what the, what, the, what the actual law is right now before we get into um, what directions we can push the law in going forward. Uh, so Daniel. Thank you, Jamal. Uh, I just checked there is no score in the game yet. <laughs> <laughs> The general consensus right now is that hate speech is not illegal and cannot be prevented. But we're really in a state of flux, and it's, it's not that simple. Uh, there are many tools in the law's toolbox that exist now for approaching it from different directions. I mean, for example, you can prohibit, the law can prohibit, incitement to violence, but you can't do it in advance because of the re restriction on prior restraints. But there was a case in 1969, a very uh, famous case called Brandenburg versus Ohio. What it did, in many ways very notably, it reversed or cut back on, uh, enhanced Oliver Wendell Holmes and Brandeis's clear and present danger test. What the court said in that case was it's okay to ban advocacy of force or violation of the law if two criteria are met. If the advocacy is aimed at inciting or producing imminent lawless action, and it's likely to do so. Now that's a very strict test to try to meet. But then you get into other aspects of the First Amendment. It has to be only the government that it applies to. A private organization 
is not subject to the First Amendment. First Amendment, as the text shows, it's only against Congress and then applicable to the states by virtue of the 14th Amendment. Then there is the distinction between speech and action. At what point does some sort of expression really slide into action? Speech, no regulation. Action can be regulated. There are arguments that some aspects of hate speech are a form of action. For example, fighting words. Um, the old Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire case, there, that's an exception uh, to uh, First Amendment protection. Well, does hate speech amount to fighting words? On the other hand, you have a series of cases from the 1950s about what's known as the heckler's veto, that the audience reaction shouldn't amount to a veto over a speaker's right to uh, voice an opinion. Well, those are tools to be used um, by either side, but they're in some ways antagonistic to each other, a principle and a counter principle. Again, the general uh, expression is that you can have reasonable restrictions of uh, freedom of speech as to time, place, or manner, but not content. Well, you can do a lot with time, place, and manner to avoid uh, some problems, but these have to be narrowly tailored and you have to worry about vagueness and overbreath in the law, which isn't allowed. What we have really is a changing notion, as Jamal um, indicated, and that's probably what we're going to be talking about today because of um, what's been happening. And the, the real issue, which I think is what the whole discussion tonight will be about, is whether we approach the First Amendment of freedom of speech as a form of value pluralism, that it's not the only value, the supreme value, that there are competing values, and that uh, we have to make difficult choices. Uh, uh, Isaiah Berlin and Oxford, uh, Don, has uh, wonderful writing on this, that a, a great problem uh, for um, all of us is choosing between valuable goals when sometimes they can't be perfectly reconciled. And we have to make a choice in a particular instance which one we are going to um, allow in that particular instance to dominate. And that's what I think we're talking about with hate speech. That's the thumbnail summary. Well, thank you, uh, Daniel. And that puts uh, quite a lot of issues on the table. And I, I want to pick up exactly where you left off, uh, which is this question of value pluralism. Uh, the First Amendment is, of course, first in the Constitution, and so there is some sense in which uh, we should think about it in some way different from other values that are enshrined within the Constitution. So the value of equality is also in the Constitution, and so sometimes those might come into uh, some conflict with each other. And so my question is, and I'll, I might put this question to Floyd uh, just to start off, uh, is uh, when, we, when we think about the First Amendment as, uh, and free, freedom of speech as being a kind of first among equals or being a, a kind of value that can't be trumped in the ordinary way in which uh, values can be trumped. Uh, what's, the, what's the reason for that? What's the harm that we are worried about? Uh, so I'll give, you, I'll, I'll give us sort of two examples of cases uh, that some of you might be familiar with, uh, most of you are likely familiar with at least one of these cases. So the Skokie case uh, in uh, Illinois in the 1970s, uh, a group of uh, Nazi sympathizers uh, wanted to stage a march through uh, the city of Skokie, Illinois, uh, and uh, they, uh, uh, and knowing that the, the town was uh, the home to a number of Holocaust survivors. Uh, that's example one. Uh, example two, uh, the fairly recent uh, case uh, Snyder versus Phelps, in which uh, members of the Westboro Baptist Church, um, which uh, likes to engage in provocative uh, public demonstrations, uh, decided to uh, protest the funeral of a, uh, a, a Marine who had been killed in uh, the line of duty. Uh, and uh, and, and so there, there's some question about the facts, but in a stylized way, the facts are 
uh, they, were, they, were, they were there protesting the funeral, and the, the Supreme Court said they have a, a perfect right to do that, even in provocative and insulting ways to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, the Marine's family and to the deceased Marine, notwithstanding that we have torts of intentional infliction of emotional distress and so forth. So, uh, so uh, words can be harmful. Uh, that there's, there's not really any question about that. They can be harmful. Why treat them different from other kinds of harms? Well, I would say that the, uh, the dominant uh, theory uh, and purpose, I would say, of the First Amendment is uh, anti-sensorial. It is rooted in deep distrust of government coming too close with respect to speech, press, religion. Uh, and uh, the, the, the value that, that it embodies most of all uh, is the concern, uh, a 1984-like concern uh, of government misconduct, government suppression of speech, uh, and the like. And it's primarily, I would say, because of that concern that you know one winds up with these uh, horror stories and cases. I mean, awful, antisocial, destructive speech, which we alone in the world uh, protect. So, just to offer one hate speech example, uh, things that candidate Trump said in his campaign um, about Mexicans and Muslims to take two groups would be criminal throughout most of Western Europe because in most of Western, in all of Western Europe, really, uh, they do make it a crime to engage in what we loosely call hate speech. Hillary also would have been vulnerable for the basket of deplorables comment. I think we have to make it a nonpartisan example. I don't think it would actually be. Well, I, uh, I've, uh, I've, sadly, I I've studied the I don't think the deplorables is hate speech. Yeah. Uh, it's defined very, very broadly in many countries. Just because you're writing a book about it, maybe. <laughs> uh, 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 now, so, you know, we wind up uh, in a situation in which we really are unique in the world uh, in the degree of protection we afford and the degree to which we, we sort of gulp uh, and say, uh, you know, we're, we'll allow this and we'll allow that. Uh, final introductory example, in England, not so long ago, a person with a big placard uh, showing the World Trade Center ablaze and language on it uh, saying stop the Islamification of England was found guilty of the crime of uh, demeaning uh, uh, all Muslims. Um, we would call that political speech, painful, painful political speech but it wouldn't be a close case here. Uh, and, that, and that conviction has been upheld as many convictions throughout Europe have been upheld by uh, international bodies outside their countries themselves. The European uh, Convention on Human Rights uh, has been interpreted in, in that way. But that's my short answer. <laughs> well, let me, let me ask about that. And I might, I might ask a question of, uh, of Carmel uh, uh, in response to to, to this, and I'll, I'll characterize what Floyd said as in the terms that my colleague Vince Blasey uh, once used of a, a pathological perspective, uh, which is to say one of the reasons we regulate, uh, we, we, we worry about regulation of hate speech is because we're worried about the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario is government censorship of political speech that the government disagrees with. Uh, but uh, part of the question I think for, for us to, to puzzle through is whether that, that pathological perspective is essentially paranoid. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and so uh, there are gradations. Right? There are uh, uh, ways in which maybe through the back door uh, we end up regulating speech all the time. So, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask 
uh, Carmelin, if she can elaborate on the example of, uh, you know, we have hate crimes laws, right? We, so, we, so Daniel started out by, um, by distinguishing speech from action. But of course, in order to, uh, to regulate hate crimes, uh, one has to use uh, speech as evidence. Uh, so, uh, so my question for Carmelin is, is whether one runs up against First Amendment limits in thinking through uh, uh, hate crimes, or if there are other examples from your work in which uh, the, the questions of, 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 of what the limits might be uh, become front and center. So, you know, so our agency is the New York City's Commission on Human Rights, and, uh, you know, we're the agency that's charged with uh, enforcing the city's very, uh, very broad and very protective anti-discrimination and anti-harassment protections. And so I, I think when we're talking about, um, you know, hate speech or we're talking about bias incidents, this comes up, of course, in situations in which we're looking at civil claims of discrimination or harassment that might be occurring throughout the city, right? Um, and, you know, one of the conversations I was having earlier is how I think that the need or the, the desire that people have in looking for something as a hate crime or defining something as a hate crime is in the need for a, a, you know, a victim of a bias incident or a community for them to have some sort of documentation or record or some sort of government uh, recognition of a harm that has been done to them. And that, you know, in New York City, we have something that's somewhat akin to a civil form of hate crime called discriminatory harassment, uh, which, has been, which was added to the human rights law since 1991. And that's basically where, you know, there's some sort of act, uh, it has to be a physical, physical act of force or threat of force um, used against somebody because of their membership in one of the protected categories. Where, that, where the kind of bad actor does so intentionally or knowingly uh, to interfere with somebody's right. And that could happen outside of the usual civil rights, human rights context of you know, housing or employment or looking at the relationship between customers and public accommodations. And, you know, and I think increasingly, especially you know, uh, in the last year or so at the commission, we've been looking at other ways of thinking through besides enforcement, or, or civil law enforcement or, or you know, communities that are generally uh, uh, more vulnerable, I think, to these types of bias incidents. These are also communities that, quite frankly, have had very challenging relationships with criminal law enforcement and so really are looking for an alternative to hate crimes or to criminal law enforcement. And so uh, there are ways in which we will respond with uh, uh, you know, sending out a, a bias response team from our community uh, outreach area, our community relations bureau, to go into those communities and to find out and record what's happened, whether or not they, they rise to the level of what would be considered under, you know, the penal code as a hate crime or what would arise to the level of uh, even a civil claim, because there is that need for recognition and documentation of the wrong. Um, you know, some of the materials I left at the front are uh, regarding a, a new survey project that we're undertaking where we are uh, specifically looking at Muslim, Arab, South Asian, uh, and Jewish communities since there's been such an increase in either, you know, uh, violence attacks or bias attacks in those communities where we're asking folks to take a five-minute survey to let us know between, you know, July of 2016 and now, what are they experiencing in the city? with regards to hate crime or discrimination or harassment, but really being very inclusive so that there is, there's kind of this outlet for communities to express the wrongs that are being done to them outside of a criminal law enforcement uh, uh, setting. So Nadine, I, I saw you nodding when I started talking about hate crime, and uh, Carmelin has just talked about some of the efforts of this, the, the city to not just use traditional law enforcement, but also use other mm -hmm. avenues. And I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, as someone who's been a, a strong defender of uh, freedom of speech throughout your career, uh, do, do you see any slippery slope or do you see any, any, uh, uh, any danger area uh, when we talk about hate crime? Well, uh, and is it just a matter of semantics? 
The more I uh, learned about U.S. law in writing my book, the more respectful I became of the nuanced distinction it makes between when hate speech, which I put in quotes uh, because it has no official legal definition at all, and if I can make a parenthesis, uh, I think most of us use it most commonly to refer to speech that discriminates on some particular basis. But yes, our European uh, countries have defined it much more broadly as any speech about any group. And in this country, if you pay attention to how people uh, use the term, it's to denounce any idea that they hate on college campuses, chalking the word Trump was considered to be hate speech, and on other campuses, uh, a very different messages would be. But our law draws a distinction between hate speech that cannot be punished merely because of its viewpoint or message, as opposed to hate speech, along with speech that conveys any other message that can, as Dan explained, in particular contexts be punished, and those contexts all satisfy this general concept of an emergency, as defined initially by Brandeis and Holmes, and it includes not only intentional incitement and fighting words, discriminatory harassment, as Carmelin discussed, uh, genuine threats would be another example. And when you look at um, articles and, and, and hear people who advocate censoring hate speech in this country, at least 90% of the examples they give are already punishable. Many of them are actually hate crimes, which I prefer to call bias crimes, because what is being punished is not the idea, but the discriminatory selection, the intentional discrimination in singling out a victim on the basis of race, gender, religion, or so forth. And as Jamal indicated, the speech can indirectly be punished because it often is very direct evidence of a discriminatory motive in committing the crime. So a lot of speech that causes actual harm, including actual crimes, can be punished, but hateful ideas and ideas that we hate cannot be punished. And I think that's exactly right. Well, I want to I want to put a, a question that um, that this distinction raises for me. Uh, I'll, I'll put this I'll put this to Alex, uh, but uh, I'm really curious to hear uh, the reaction anyone's reaction who wants to to weigh in on it. Uh, and that's and uh, Daniel started out by talking about Isaiah Berlin, uh, who very famously distinguished between negative and positive liberties. Uh, when we when we talk about protecting uh, freedom of speech in the United States, we typically don't talk about it in a way that is sensitive to the, to the kind of penalty or the, or the way in which the government is regulated, right? So if the government says, we're gonna slap a fine on you if you say the following, or we're gonna block you from Twitter if you say the following, uh, we, we think of that analytically, we tend to, in the same way we think about if, if I say I'm going to put you in prison, if you say the following or, or do the following, and so I'm, I, part of my part of my question is whether uh, whether there's a, there's some space within regulation of freedom of speech for thinking about sensitivity to the way in which uh, someone is being is being punished or limited, and the the reason that's connected to this question about positive liberty is. Because the, you know the government also subsidizes speech in various ways, right? And so, uh, should we think about the government's subsidy of speech and the limits, or the limits, or the regulation of that, in the same ways that we think about actually punishing people? How do we how do we think through the different ways in which uh, one can one can regulate speech? So, I think there is space for those sorts of distinctions, and to the extent that. Uh, the analysis of whether uh, conduct or speech is protected constitutionally is at least at the margins of a balancing of interests, then certainly relevant to that balance is the extent to which the government is putting the thumb on one side of the scale or the other and the severity with which it is putting its thumb on that side of the scale. Um, you know, and, and an example I would give, not in the context of uh, hateful speech, in another context is uh, you know the uh, Arizona Free Press Coalition case, the case involving Arizona's effort to uh, 
implement a form of a campaign, fi campaign finance reform that involved uh, triggered matching of public funding for, for candidates. And the court there conceived of, once it had determined that the harm, which in that case was uh, uh, additionally subsidizing the publicly funded candidate on the basis of the privately funded candidates uh, added uh, fundraising, once they conceived of that as a First Amendment harm, the analysis flowed pretty quickly to, in, in the way that you're talking about, Jamal, it was, it was a harm and so now we're into you know, the remedy phase, which was striking down that scheme. And it, there may have been room for more sensitivity to the exact nature of that harm and the extent of it um, in the First Amendment analysis. Uh, in the hate speech context, I think it uh, can be a bit trickier. I'd want to hear what exactly the proposal would be in terms of a, um, you know, a more minor imposition on speech than a criminal penalty. And I would still be deeply suspicious of efforts uh, that try to solve uh, a problem that is uh, often experienced by minority communities through uh, the empowering of majorities. Uh, because my sense is that uh, most prosecutors who live in jurisdictions where we worry most about uh, the effects of hateful speech, the very real damaging harmful effects of hateful speech, um, would not be as sympathetic to the sorts of claims people in this audience, including me, would be concerned about. Um, they might be more concerned about, uh, you know, as Nadine said, uh, things that they consider to be hateful speech in their context based on their, you know, based on their uh, majoritarian instincts. Uh, so I'd still be suspicious of it. I'd want to hear the specific proposal, but I think there is room for considering the severity of the, of the punishment that you're talking about. So uh, along the lines of what Alex was, was talking about, this is a fairly famous example in the context of the uh, United Kingdom race relations law, the, the first prosecution under that law was of, uh, was of a, a black man um, a, give, a, a tell, a, a tr kind of cursing out a, a white police officer with a racial slur. Right. So he was, he was prosecuted under the uh, British uh, hate crimes law in the 1960s. Uh, but Nadine, you well, since you mentioned subsidy, and we've had a lot of this going on now where governments have exercised their prerogative as speakers themselves to choose which messages to purvey and which to eschew. And I have some disagreement with others, uh, and maybe we'll get some disagreement on this panel, uh, but I do believe that government should have the power to say we are not going to continue to support a Confederate monument or a uh, Confederate flag or a statue of, of Robert E. Lee. That is, if you don't like the way the government is exercising its free speech rights to choose to not endorse messages that it sees as uh, hateful or racist, then your remedy is at the ballot box, but uh, you have no First Amendment recourse. Now, the government would have to allow private speakers to protest that decision to remove the statue and so forth, but uh, that could be an example that I think would also um, palliate a lot of people. So when you say hate speech is not for Protected, I think it's 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 not quite accurate. People would hear that and think, oh, that means the statue of Robert E. Lee must stay there forever, and that's not true. Well, that's also just a way of saying, I think, that the government itself, uh, when it speaks or engages in speech-like behavior, is not bound by the First Amendment. Yeah, that's the point. I mean, the government's bound by the First Amendment when it limits your speech. Mm -hmm. but, but the law is really very clear, uh, in fact, clearer than I'm very comfortable with, uh, that, uh, that uh, when it is governmental speech, uh, that that's, don't look to the First Amendment for your remedy, look to the ballot box, as Nadine says, and that's become very uh, even clearer you know, in uh, recent opinions uh, of the court, license plates, uh, an opinion of the court uh, just a few terms ago where uh, Texas made a decision about what sort of license, what it would put on its license plates and uh, said that it would not, uh, it would not put other views on the license plates you can put your own, but, but that Texas could say, we won't put a Confederate flag on 
even if you pay us money to do it, and even if we generally will put what you want on the license uh, if, if you pay us money for, for the effort uh, to do it. Um, and uh, you know that, that was a very controversial decision uh, of the court, very, very interesting and not, you know, not very harmful to the society no matter how it came out, uh, except as a presidential matter. Uh, but but, uh, but uh, you know, we do have, and it is clear, a law, First Amendment law, uh, to the effect that the government, when it speaks, is not bound by it. I actually want to want to ask about that that specific case, uh, and I want to I want to actually put that that very question to the people on the panel. Uh, this is the Texas license plate case because it really is at the uh, it kind of sits at the at the at the crux of a lot of what we've just been talking about. Um, to the, the how much harm is there really in the government limiting choices in a certain kind of way? How does government speech factor in? All right, so uh, as Floyd mentioned, uh, this was the sons of Confederate veterans who wanted to put a Confederate flag on their Texas license plates. And Texas uh, had, a, Texas had a, a, a program where if you came to the, to the relevant state agency and you said, uh, I want to put my, my symbol on the license plate, they seem to have a fairly liberal policy of allowing you to do so. But then when the Sons of Confederate Veterans showed up uh, with their Confederate flag, they said, actually, uh, I think we're not going to let you put that on the license plate. And they sued and said, this is just viewpoint discrimination. This is the worst kind of First Amendment violation. Uh, and it, it, it presented the court with a tricky problem, uh, as, as Floyd kind of teed up. Uh, if this is private speech by the, by the individual drivers, then, uh, then under the court's cases, it seems like this is, in fact, viewpoint discrimination, and you need a compelling interest that has to satisfy strict scrutiny for the government to be able to regulate in this way. Uh, if it's government speech, the government can do whatever it wants, as, as Floyd uh, mentioned. Now, the problem with calling it government speech, which is what the court does, right? You get five members of the court, including Clarence Thomas, by the way, saying this is government speech. And, uh, and therefore, they can put whatever they want in it. But that's, as, as Justice Alito in dissent um, says, uh, and he, he, it's, he, he, has a, he has a field day with that holding, because there are lots of things on the license plates that are clearly not the speech of the state of Texas. All right, I'd rather be golfing, is one of the go Sooners, yeah. right? Uh, uh, the Oklahoma football team uh, is not something that Texas is likely to endorse, right? And so, and so the court really just kind of, you know, it, it knew that it couldn't strike, it, it didn't want to strike this down applying traditional First Amendment analysis. So if you, if, you, if you accept what I'm asserting, which is that the government speech rationale is a flimsy one, uh, then uh, what do you make of that case? So, Could I say something about it? Because no, I, I think... No, I really disagree as a factual matter, or maybe you would call it a mixed question of fact and law, whether that could fairly be characterized as government speech. I don't think anybody disagrees with the doctrine that if it is fairly characterized as government speech, then you have no First Amendment claim. But I think the dissenters really had the best of this. Uh, the criteria that Texas used included the word offensive and disparaging, uh, the usual. And I think it really illustrates the danger of turning that power over to any authority because the standards are inherently subjective and discretionary, which means that they are going to be enforced in a way that is unpredictable and arbitrary at best, discriminatory at worst. Now, they had allowed the Sons of Confederate Veterans license plate to go through until certain members of the community started organizing and putting pressure on the government to change its ruling. Another group of citizens objected on similar grounds to 
a license plate that was commemorating the Buffalo Soldiers. These were African American soldiers, so you could say that's, that's wonderful, that's pro-equality, but it was groups of Native Americans who said, our ancestors were slaughtered in the most brutal way by cavalry troops, including the Buffalo Soldiers. We can't look at that without feeling, you know, trauma and, re and, and, and stigmatization and reliving the terror that was visited upon our ancestors. But they didn't have enough political clout. So the Buffalo Soldiers license plate went through. And that, that to me is inevitable when you work with these quote standards. I, I think we're starting to get to what is the real crux of the issue today. And that is, when people find things that are offensive and therefore they want to stop that speech, you've got a clash because it could make a Swiss cheese of the First Amendment. Many groups have things that they don't like to hear. If it's Jews, anti-Semitism, if it's Catholics, abortion, if it's women, pornography. Um, and not all if, women. If, <laughs> Misogyny um, for African Americans, racism, slavery, um, people on college campuses not wanting speakers to appear. You have the, the shift that the audience, the listener, is determining what can or cannot be said, and that's where the rubber meets the road uh, now in a lot of the examples. And the question is, uh, is that something that we're going to tolerate as part of the, the value pluralism or uh, whether it's going to be limited to things like um, reputation in a libel situation, privacy, or national security, um, or in, in uh, Floyd's uh, Citizens United case, I think the, uh, the court missed the countervailing value in the integrity of the electoral or political process uh, in that, it may not be one of the... These uh, are fighting words. <laughs> understood. But, but that, those are the real issues that are going on now. Um, is the First Amendment something that's going to survive when people feel strongly opposed to what's being said? They hate what's being said. And that's the difficulty that, as a society, uh, we're wrestling with. Let me come back to the license plate case, because it's just, it really is very interesting. Uh, first, the law has been clear for some time that if the government has a, a message they want to send on the license plate, you don't have to carry it. That was a case out of New Hampshire in which someone objected to having to have on his or her license, live free or die. And, and, and the answer that the Supreme Court gave was, New Hampshire cannot compel, as a price tag for getting a driver's license, that you, you carrying the government's message. Okay, so that's, that's one, one area. Then next to it we say, well, the government can say anything it wants on the license plate, subject to your right to take it off. So Texas could say, pro-life, or an anti-abortion message. And if you don't like it, you don't have to have it, but that can be, under current law, something that, that the government may do. And what makes it hard, what I think would made the, the case before the court hard, is all right, the government, to take my hypothetical, the government makes a, offers, or, or presumptively puts on your license plate a pro-life message, and you say, I want you, I want the government, I want the same people to put on my, my uh, pro-choice message. The government says, no, that's not what we believe. In Texas, we are this, but you can do it. And that is the law now. Texas can say what it wants. You can refuse to have it. You can't make the state put the competing message on, but you can put it on. Now, I mean, that sounds like an exquisite compromise, um, but, and that is even in this First Amendment area, you know, in which it, uh, 
it tends to sound so absolutist. Uh, it is, you know, a way to deal with the problem. But that said, I like Nadine. Uh, I like her, but uh, similar to uh, Nadine, uh, I found Justice Alito's dissent his mocking and humorous uh, dissent written with, with joy, uh, 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 very persuasive. I, I mean, here he, he gave, as you, as you pointed out, one example after another saying, I mean, you cannot, sort of John McEnroe line, you cannot be serious. I mean, you cannot be serious in saying it's government speech to say go sooner as go. It can't be government speech, but it is. Well, I, I, wanna, I, I, I don't want to leave this case alone just yet, because I, I want to I nail down a, a position here. And I, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just kind of go down the line uh, and, and state what I think is the implication of, the, of Justice Alito's dissenting opinion in that Confederate flag case, which is assuming Texas has this kind of program in place, it must allow you to put a Confederate flag under the word Texas on your license plate uh, and take out the Confederate flag, put a Nazi swastika there. If you want that symbol on your plate, Texas cannot refuse you on the ground, if it's refusing you on the grounds that it's offensive, that's not sufficient. Uh, that's the position, right? Texas must allow you to put that onto your license plate under the word Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that's the, it's not putting you in jail, it's just, so the, the alternative is, it's not putting you in jail, it's just saying, actually choose a different symbol um, to put under the, the word Texas. Uh, that's the position, that is, that's the implication of Justice Alito's dissenting opinion. Agree, disagree? Can I answer with not one of those words? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, you know, I'm not as I'm actually not as troubled by the outcome of that case as um, as uh, maybe the other half of the uh, of the panel. Uh, in part because I uh, don't find the factual circumstance to be a particularly important First Amendment battleground, um, and uh, I think the you know. I take Floyd's point from earlier that an expansive interpretation of the government speech doctrine can be really troubling a lot in a lot of circumstances, and I find that, you know, uh, while my instincts at the time that the case was being, you know, litigated and probably now are with the dissent, I'm, I'm not as factually troubled by the outcome of the case. Um, maybe I'll, if I can get away with that, I'll say that. <laughs> Did you want to weigh in at all on this, Carmona? I mean, I'll probably have a much more evasive answer by saying that. Can you get more evasive than I just gave? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think luckily under under the uh, you know the specific discriminatory harassment statute that we have in New York City, the focus is really on conduct. So, um, so in those types of situations, I think that I'm sure people would. I, I could imagine people reporting in, like, if you're using the swastika mm -hmm. example, I could see people reporting that into the agency. It's likely not something that we would respond to in a law enforcement capacity for a discriminatory harassment claim. That's likely more something that we would send out, you know, folks from community relations to talk to folks in the community to find out, you know, one, um, how it's affecting the community, and and also to let people know what their rights are in other uh, in other areas of the law, but. For purposes of filing a, a discriminatory harassment claim under the city's human rights law, we would be really looking at, at more types of examples that uh, where conduct was really the issue. So, you know, kind of the example I, I often give is, you know, the example of the, you know, the, the, the man who was driving a car, you know, uh, directed at children of color in the city while, you know, while uh, spurting out racial epithets. There's obvious conduct there. It's obviously uh, directed at a group of people because of their membership in a specific protected class, and there's actual conduct there. There's no, again, there's no you know, housing provider, tenant relationship, or employer-employee relationship, or public accommodations, customer relationship. It's still happening between private citizens, but something like that, to me, would be a clear violation of the law uh, under our law. <laughs> 
And I think in fairness, Jamal, the way you described it, it was conveying the impression that a reasonable observer would conclude that Texas was endorsing this particular message. Uh, but there would be easy ways to avoid that, as happens in any public forum where all the government is doing is endorsing the right of we the people to express our views, including views that are offensive to each other, uh, but not endorsing those messages substantively. So it have a little disclaimer, and I think people would understand. As I think, as Justice Alito said, just looking at the messages themselves would make the reasonable observer understand this is not a state-endorsed message. Texas is simply raising money by allowing people to use these as many billboards. But I don't think that would be the case uh, with respect to other state messages. If you take the hypothetical I offered earlier, if, if, if Texas, in its more rambam, rambunctious way, were to, were, were to have a, uh, uh, a pro-life uh, expression on license plates, uh, you know, the, 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 they're allowed to do that. Again, you're allowed not to carry it, but they're allowed to do that because it's government speech. That's the consequence the necessary consequence of the government speech uh, doctrine. I mean, it may be that if, if the answer to certain types of speech is, well, then we have to allow swastikers stickers too. I mean, there, there are two possible answers. One which is deeply at odds with American First Amendment law, which is we shouldn't allow swastikers. stickers. Um, and the other is the government ought to stop doing messages. Uh, um, uh, so, so we start on an even keel with no one uh, speaking. But even then, under you know our law, maybe you couldn't put it on the license plate. No one in the no one in the Texas case was saying you couldn't put it in your window, or or otherwise display what you think. Uh, I mean that that is considered you know deeply protected, uncontroversially protected. First Amendment right. Daniel, I can't tell if you're prime. Yes, well, to... the, uh, Daniel it reminds, agrees with me. It, it, no, no, it reminded me, <laughs> most of the time, it reminded me of the Slants case that uh, came down from the Supreme Court in June. Mm -hmm. uh, there you have the government issuing a trademark that was requested uh, by a group uh, that. Um, had wanted to use um, an ethnic slur as a way of uh, removing the uh, fangs from the slur. So it was an Asian American band that calling those the slams. And um, the trademark office had refused it, saying it was a disparaging remark. There was a statute that said that uh, the government does not have to approve disparaging trademarks. And the Supreme Court unanimously said, no, no, it's uh, no problem at all. It's an interference with free speech. But an argument uh, could be made and was made that by the government agreeing to the trademark, allowing the trademark, giving its imprimatur on the trademark, it's putting its thumb on the scales of derogatory comments about ethnic groups. And there have been a lot of uh, groups, the, the Washington Redskins case is uh, one that's gotten a lot of attention, but there have been ones with um, much nastier um, phrases involved, and it seems to me the government voice, the government involvement in that uh, is something that didn't get the attention uh, that it deserved. The way the court treated it said, well, it's the government not speaking, it's just the individuals, and government is just saying, okay, which is similar to some of the comments that were said. It's interesting. I, I, I did a, a brief in that case, and uh, it, it, it's really interesting that in that case, the court had no problem at all saying, well, why would you think that's government speech? Uh, uh, I mean, it's just a trademark. Uh, uh, we didn't make it up. Uh, someone else wrote it. And, uh, I mean, I was on, uh, not alone, the winning side, uh, but Bear in mind, there's a consequence to the First Amendment. The consequence of this case is that there have been far more registered marks 
with offensive, discriminatory, bias-revealing uh, denunciations of racial and religious groups in trademarks. Now, we, will the public think that's, the, uh, that's all protected at speech again? But will the public think that's the government speaking? No, I don't think so. And uh, we know whatever, it, it's always hard to know the answers to that. But there's no particular reason, I think, to think that the public will think that because uh, you could take the copyright law, you know, uh, because books are titled uh, with uh, racially discriminatory or out outrageous uh, titles, that that's the government speaking. And, and I, I, I agree with that, that people won't think that. But I just make the point that every time the court allows, in the name of the First Amendment, more speech, that also means more speech, which m most of us would find deeply disturbing. But I'm happy to report, based on thorough recent research, that uh, there's no correlation between the freedom of hateful speech versus censorship of hateful speech and actual discriminatory violence, including discriminatory harassment and other forms of discrimination in society. Obviously, correlation doesn't prove causation, but uh, so many of the European countries and Canada and Australia, after decades of uh, suppressing hate speech, have become disenchanted and so many human rights activists and lawyers in those countries are saying we ought to move more in the direction of the United States because for all of our ongoing problems of discrimination and violence, we do more strictly enforce uh, anti-discrimination laws. We do more effectively counter uh, racist violence. I mean, look at Germany, which has some of the strongest hate speech laws in the world, uh, and they just have had epidemics of discriminatory violence, and an overtly racist party just got almost 13% of the vote in the last national election. So so I'm not discouraged and depressed by the, uh, let, let the speech all come out and let us respond to it. It warns us who is likely to engage in discriminatory conduct. We can prevent that conduct and that's much more effective. Well, let me, let me, oh, did you, were you about to, let me, let me ask a question about this actually. Because uh, as, as many of you know, uh, this, I think this morning, early this morning, uh, the, uh, uh, the Mooches, Scaramucci, uh, the Mooches uh, uh, website, uh, Scaramucci Post, uh, put up a poll uh, asking people, Twitter users, to weigh in on how many Jews uh, died in the Holocaust. Uh, the poll was, uh, was immediately attacked uh, and then removed. Uh, uh, that kind of poll, as Nadine knows, uh, w would be potentially subject to criminal prosecution in uh, Germany. Uh, it would, and it would, and, and, and a number of other countries, it would violate no constitutional prohibition to regulate that kind of, uh, of poll. Uh, and it really does put a fine point on what both Floyd and Nadine have, have emphasized, which is that the US is really at one extreme in uh, the ways in which it, uh, it uh, gives a protective bubble to even very offensive speech. And part of the question, you know, Nadine has the correlation uh, down, but, uh, but of course there are different conditions in different, um, in different countries. So part of the question I wanna ask the, the panel is whether we do have something to learn from abroad uh, or whether, uh, uh, whether the rest of the world is, you know, if you think, it, if you think that it's, that it's uh, that it's bad to regulate hate speech in the US, is the rest of the world getting it wrong? Uh, or, is, or is it that they have different conditions and somehow we are truly uh, exceptional? Uh, is there something special about the US constitutional context? Uh, I guess again, sorry, I, I think it depends a bit on what values you think the First Amendment is serving. Um, if, your, uh, if your primary concern is that empowering majorities to decide what is or is not hateful speech, then the experiences of other countries uh, in terms of 
whether they've uh, started down that path and gone down a slippery slope as a result, I think are relevant to understanding whether that concern is a real one or, or is not. But there are other values that the First Amendment is meant to serve as well. And part of, you know, one thing that the, uh, that those who resist regulation uh, of hate speech believe that they are committing to by, by defending that position is um, the idea in this country that uh, the best way to uh, uh, identify uh, and respond to and fight back against hateful ideas is to expose them and respond. Um, and, uh, you know, whether we can learn uh, that other countries have been successful in, in that endeavor um, uh, through the criminal punishment of, of hateful speech it seems you know less likely to me that we'll that we'll learn that it has actually occurred, but maybe it's possible. Um, and so you know a third reason why we um, protect hate speech, I think, uh, uh, on which we're less likely to get uh, information from the experience of other countries, is a more basic commitment of self democratic government. Right? We we have uh, one founding principle of the free speech thought in this country is the idea that. Uh, we don't take ideas off the table because majorities need to be free to decide what, uh, who to elect and what ideas to embrace. Um, and uh, criminalizing hate speech, uh, you know, is uh, an affront to that principle. And it may be that some people, for some people, it's worth the cost. Um, but no amount of experience of uh, foreign countries in regulating hate speech will answer that kind of first-order question of principle and your commitment to self-government through free speech. Are we so different from Canada, or is Canada wrong? <laughs> well, that discussion was reminding me of uh, uh, an example of American exceptionalism in the, the best sense, in the First Amendment. Um, some years ago, uh, Congress and several of the states passed laws saying that if someone who obtained a libel judgment in a foreign country that did not have our constitutional protections, they could not enforce it in this country. It was called libel tourism. Um, London was considered a very easy place for a libel plaintiff to go and obtain uh, a libel judgment. Well, we're sort of imposing our rule about the First Amendment and libel on the rest of the world, saying, that's great, you've got that, but if you're suing an American, American publisher, American writer, you can't collect on that judgment, and in fact, it would be voided, and if you tried to collect on it, you'd even have to pay legal fees uh, to the defendant. That's an example where uh, our tilt is much more in favor of the First Amendment than even other countries who do believe in free speech, just not in the same sense that we do. But to, to answer your question, are we that different from Canada, the answer is no. Even with a much watered down and much belatedly adopted version of the First Amendment, the Canadian Supreme Court still was deeply split over whether the first hate speech law that came before it was unconstitutional under their Charter of Rights and Freedoms. There's very persuasive dissent. And I understand that from the enforcement record, there's big disenchantment with how the law actually operates, and it's almost never enforced anymore. I mean, the first major case involved a school teacher who was indoctrinating his students in anti-Semitic tirades that would have been punishable in our country, right? Because he was a government employee and he was, um, uh, you know, uh, violating his profession responsibilities, but anyway, the government in Canada wasted more than a decade in the prosecution, a lot of money. Um, he ended up getting uh, a very minor sentence, and uh, even when he was in prison, his website was still sending out hate messages. So a lot of money and not much bang for the buck. And observers who have compared different countries uh, that do have hate speech laws in the United States that, that doesn't, many of them have observed that our social pressures and our culture is, and our civil society is actually much more effective in repressing and discouraging and stigmatizing hate speech than these government punishment schemes actually function in other countries. So the kind of speech that, um, that, that Trump got away with here 
uh, and would not have, would, would ostensibly, and, and in some countries Hillary would have been punishable too, uh, even though there are laws that would criminalize that kind of speech, powerful politicians around the country, around the world, routinely get away with denigrating minorities and with making hateful statements against minorities. Uh, and much, and, and there's even the social pressure in this country uh, generally has a more suppressive impact than a lot of laws in a lot of other countries. Let, let, let me mention what I think is the most recent Canadian Supreme Court case uh, as a sort of response to what Nadina said. Uh, in Saskatchewan, uh, they were about to teach about homosexuality in high schools. Uh, an individual, we might call him a religious zealot, was uh, outraged by that, hand printed out uh, copies uh, of a sort of a personal uh, one page manifesto saying you're gonna teach buggery, you're gonna do this, you're gonna do that, you're gonna justify homosexuality, you're gonna do all those things in much uh, harsher language than, than I've just used and put them in mailboxes around Saskatchewan. Guilty, affirmed, affirmed, no dissents in the Supreme Court. A minor punishment, yes, to be sure, uh, but, uh, but a, a judgment which would be unthinkable here and which would also have no dissents here, but on the other side. You know, well, you know, to, to Nadine's point, I think, though I have not done the kind of one-for-one -one analysis of, you know, specific countries and what their hate speech laws are and their, uh, their laws for discrimination or harassment in other contexts, and what I do find to be interesting is that at least with some of them, um, while some of those jurisdictions may have very, uh, you know, strict hate speech related laws, if you look at the protections that exist, the discrimination related protections that exist in areas where I think nationally here in the United States, we would consider to be, you know, fairly well established. So in housing, in employment, places of public accommodation, those protections have not gone nearly as far as what we've seen, even in some of what I think people here would consider to be some of our more conservative jurisdictions. You know, uh, I was just at a, a conference in Seattle uh, about two weeks ago at a conference of international human rights related agencies. So agencies like the New York City Commission on Human Rights in other jurisdictions, both in, in the United States as well as internationally. And when I was talking about some of the protections that we have that exist in New York City, like specific protections against discrimination based on gender identity and gender expression in the context of employment and how we would be interpreting the law, how it, discrimination sometimes manifests in some of these areas, people were shocked. People were shocked that we actually had the ability as government uh, to, to regulate that type of uh, discrimination or that type of uh, uh, activity or behavior in contexts like employment. So while I haven't done the, the kind of, you know, country, by country specific analysis, I do find it interesting that in, in the context that I think most people I would imagine in this room or nationally would think these are areas where, yes, we would want to address areas of discrimination or harassment. There are many of those countries that where hate speech, I think, is, is very much respected. Those types of protections are still uh, pretty, pretty far behind. You know, one, uh, one difference uh, in the Canadian constitutional context, just in, uh, in engaging with Nadine, one difference that the that, that the Canadian Supreme Court has identified is that the, that, that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms um, has a sp specifically protects the, uh, mul the multicultural identity of Canadians. Uh, and they, they, the, there's a kind of constitutional ethos uh, within Canada uh, that we are a multicultural nation and we protect that as a constitutional value. We don't tend to say that in the US Supreme Court. Um, there's a, one could ask whether we should say that in the U.S. Supreme Court in light of, uh, of the 14th Amendment, but we have tended to take a much more negative liberty approach to, to rights, which is to say it's, the government doesn't have an obligation to protect rights of equality or rights of pluralism or rights of multiculturalism. The government is only really obligated to not infringe on those rights, and that, 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 that difference might explain some of the 
uh, difference in the Canadian context. And yet when you look at the landmark free speech decisions, it's no coincidence that they so many of them come out of the civil rights movement and the court is bending over backwards to um, unleash the, uh, the speech of Martin Luther King and other civil rights demonstrators that was suppressed and punished under every available legal tool. And I think if you look at the history of the U.S., censoring hateful and hated speech uh, has always been used as to suppress everybody from abolitionists to, you know, crusaders for birth control. That's why Margaret Sanger was in prison. And uh, even more recently, the LGBT rights movement. Uh, and conversely, freedom of speech has been essential to protect freedom that even extends to viewpoints that are, are hated and despised. Because as strange as it seems to us, pro-civil rights, pro-abolitionist speech was seen as being very dangerous. And one of the things that to me was interesting was to see the critique of abolitionist speech as causing emotional trauma, as being defamatory, uh, as endangering the safety and security. And from their perspective, those were all of the harms of pro-abolitionist speech. But that's, those are exactly the same harms that are being raised today as being caused by uh, today's version of hate speech. I, I wanna, on, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, can, go I, ahead. can I quibble with one part of what you said too, Jim? So, um, it's true, what, what, you what you said, okay. uh, if, if that's right, as a moderator, you know, maybe you have enough views as the moderator. I have but, no um, views. So uh, I, I don't know that it's fair to say that, uh, you know, to kind of take the government off the hook so quickly by, you know, dividing, using the First Amendment to divide government responsibility as between negative and positive liberties. I think the First Amendment reflects, um, maybe more accurately, a commitment with respect to the means that the government uses to address certain problems. Um, and it reflects a commitment that, uh, for this one set of problems we have in society, hate, you know, uh, views held by some who are, that are uh, hateful, the means we will use are you know, ones of persuasion and condemnation rather than uh, you know, imprisonment and liability. And I think there's a real debate to be had about you know, uh, whether we're being successful in the use of those means, whether, the, whether um, we as a society are uh, taking the opportunities we must to condemn hateful speech, whether government is doing enough, um, uh, through programs like Carmelins or others around the country or through public speeches being given that can help, you know, change the culture. Um, but in, you know, in questioning whether government is uh, using those opportunities enough or seeking them out, I think you kind of also identify the problem with relying on majoritarian institutions to solve uh, the problem of ideas held that are hateful, which is that um, the wrong majoritarian institutions will not go out of their way to solve those problems. This administration, this Department of Justice, is not going to, uh, you know, give the sorts of speeches or uh, engage in the sort of enforcement that Carmelin is doing. That might change uh, culture where it most needs to be changed through, you know, permissible enforcement. So I want to I want to ask a question that that actually picks up each of these last comments, which is, uh, which is about the the function of time. Here we have a when we think about freedom of speech, we have a we have a kind of paradigm case in mind. And that's the, the guy on the soapbox in the park who wants to say his piece and he's saying things that are, that are contrary to the government. The government shouldn't be able to suppress what that person is saying. Uh, another paradigm case comes out of the civil rights movement, right, which, was it, which is instrumental, was instrumental in the US not having hate speech laws. Uh, that there was a time when it was very much on the table whether the U.S. would have hate speech regulation and the NAACP was opposed to it for the, exactly the reasons Nadine suggests. Uh, but of course, paradigms change over time. Uh, and I wanna, I wanna ask uh, about technology and about the passage of time and what we are looking forward to uh, uh, in the future. So Daniel started out by talking about Brandenburg versus Ohio. And Brandenburg uh, involved a, a, a KKK group, a local KKK group in Ohio that was having a party the, the way only the KKK can uh, around a bonfire uh, with guns. Uh, and Ohio had an overbroad law that regulated their behavior. 
and the Supreme Court said that's, that law is too broad. Uh, in 1969, when Brandenburg's decided, yes, you're worried about the KKK uh, in, to some degree, but you know these guys were out in the woods somewhere. Uh, they, they, if they want to have a rally, it's just going to be them and their friends. Uh, and you sort of, when you're, you're stacking up the costs and benefits of regulating versus not regulating, you say, you know, don't give them the oxygen they're looking for. Same with Skokie, right? Don't give them the oxygen they're looking for. Let them, let them sort of exhaust their, uh, their id and, uh, and, 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 and then go home, right? But today, and we see this with Charlottesville, uh, a neo-Nazi group or a KKK group that wants to organize uh, has a much greater capacity to do so uh, on a much wider scale. All right, and so when we think about the historical examples of free speech gone awry, uh, the uh, hate speech gone awry, the uh, radio in Rwanda, uh, anti-Tutsi radio in Rwanda, or uh, anti-Jewish propaganda in Nazi Germany, uh, that's that's, it's, it's, it, it might be harder to contain that kind of um, momentum uh, today than it might have been uh, in 1969, question mark, right? So should we think about, should we think about um, regulation and the, the, the balance of costs differently in light of technological change? And that's for anyone. Uh, Daniel, you want to? Well, there was an article in the Times about three weeks ago um, about um, a socialist group actually the Trotsky's group, that was complaining that their uh, website was being suppressed by Google so that uh, if you wanted to find their website, it was no longer in the first or second um, list under socialism. It would be 10 or 15 pages mm -hmm. uh, down, and Google had said that they were doing it in response to the government's uh, request that there be no bias or no, it wasn't quite hate speech, but... Um, um, irresponsible talk um, on the net. And the article made a very convincing uh, case that it was really a form of uh, para-governmental uh, limiting of speech, and um, Google didn't respond uh, in the article. And I thought that, that the electronics have changed everything. Well, these things, I think, are the, uh, to me, the single most important uh, free speech issues uh, around now, uh, where the government is not, suppose we subtract the government pressure uh, out of the last thing you said, because that, that, d that does bring the First Amendment back uh, into play. Uh, I don't think as a society we've thought enough about what we want Google and Facebook to do in these areas. For example, hate speech. Do we want Facebook to have a policy? It does. I put aside enforcement. It does have a policy with respect to uh, insulting, uh, demeaning, uh, racist speech. They say they don't carry it, and they say they won't carry it. Now, the government can't do that. And you can make a very strong argument that Google is more powerful by far than the government uh, uh, in, in almost every respect. Um, and, and what I find interesting intellectually now about this is that I think as a you know, sort of educated public, we don't know what we want them to do. I mean, for example, I'm in favor of their policy. I wish they would do more of what in a journalistic sense we would call editing. Put aside, they run certain additional legal risk of, of losing their immunity from lawsuits. That, that's their problem. Uh, in terms of, you know, would we like Google to say, do, do we want Facebook to engage in some process where A, it doesn't carry, quote, fake news, unquote, genuinely, fake news, fabricated news? Do we want them to have a policy against carrying overtly racist speech? Do we want them, in effect, to be playing an editorial role, or do we want them to be like the telephone company, which just carries? The latter. And, and 
And, and what, what that brings up to me is the, the, very, the very answer to the very first question that you asked, sort of what's the First Amendment about? Yes, the First Amendment is not by chance, not by happenstance, about a protecting against the government. So, uh, and, and I think the good the First Amendment does with, a, with obvious price tags attached to it is all in the area of avoiding government suppression, control, pressure over speech. It's different when you have a private entity, but when you have a private entity with the extraordinary power of Facebook, I, I don't think we've had a national dialogue at all about what, what we would like them to do. Put aside what we can make them do. Well, I think everybody has an idea of what speech they think uh, should not be on any of the online intermediaries. But what's very, so first of all, uh, they're not transparent about what their standards are. There's no accountability for enforcing those standards. So there are due process problems as well as, I mean, obviously no state action, but in a generic sense, problems of fairness and accountability, transparency. But some media have recently been doing very very troubling but predictable analyses uh, as they've gotten hold of the criteria and standards that Facebook, for example, sends out to its uh, thousands of censors around the world. Facebook now said last summer that it is taking down almost 300,000 hate messages per month. Well, at the same time, you're getting complaints from many in the civil rights community, including a coalition of 77 individuals and organizations that are engaged in civil rights and civil liberties, including the ACLU, which for years now have been complaining to Facebook about the discriminatory way that their standards are enforced so that complaints by Black Lives Matter against police violence and abuses is taken down as hate speech. Protests by Native Americans against the pipeline uh, construction are taken down as hate speech, and uh, conversely, threats and uh, discriminatory harassment against members of minority groups are not being taken down. So to me, that just illustrates the inherent uh, subjectivity and arbitrary and discriminatory nature of anybody with power enforcing these laws. It's not going to redound to the benefit of minorities or dissenters. So you would say then that you would prefer if Facebook made no effort. I would prefer right? that they be a common carrier as they're you know, allowed to be under the Communications Decency Act and just be required to carry everything. Now, I wasn't talking about what the law should yeah, be. Yeah. I was talking about what policies that that would be would my like that Facebook would that would be my preference as the and make no mistake about it as the lesser of the evils here. I see a lot of downsides, but I think the downsides of empowering them to make these distinctions are much greater. Well, we haven't actually gotten to your question. I was, I was going to try. Well, to, I, I, you know, you go well, first. So maybe I'll start with what Florida needs. I, I absolutely agree. We need to have this conversation. Oftentimes, when people, you know complain about a violation of free speech of the First Amendment, they don't literally mean that there's been a violation of the First Amendment. Uh, so many of the campus debates, you know, the debates over campus speech that have been happening recently aren't actually on uh, the campuses of public universities, but on the campuses of private ones uh, to which the First Amendment doesn't literally apply. And, and so there's a debate about the free speech principle that applies uh, in this country. And that, uh, you know, as resolved as the First Amendment may seem, the the free speech principle is equally unresolved, at least as it applies you know, to the general public in circumstances like Facebook's monitoring of what takes place on its platform or Google's monitoring of what takes place on its platform. Uh, and I agree that this, the conversation about the uh, obligations of these companies or what we expect of them hasn't been uh, sufficiently you know, thought out. And there is, I think, probably room for nuance. Um, companies play different roles at different times. Some companies in some contexts uh, may have a claim themselves to, uh, you know, an expressive curation of, of particular forums. Other companies operate at a much lower level of, of internet accessibility so that they might uh, seem like quintessential public utilities. Um, you know, there's a very interesting uh, piece written by uh, 
the CEO of a company called Cloudflare. Yeah. And you probably haven't heard about Cloudflare, but it handles about 10% of the world's internet traffic, or it touches about 10% of the world's internet traffic. Um, and it's responsible for distributing traffic to make sure uh, that the internet r runs quickly, that if you have a website up, it can be reached uh, quickly from anywhere in, in the world. Uh, and you know, they describe themselves sort of in the way that Twitter used to at one point, which is you know, the free speech wing of the free speech party. Uh, and one day after, um, uh, I think, people from the uh, Daily Stormer, a, I think this is an accurate description, an alt-right website, um, claim that... They're a little bit farther right than that. Okay, yeah. You <laughs> could an alt, call alt -right them neo-Nazi. Yeah, a neo-Nazi website. Um, uh, they, they started claiming on their uh, message boards that the reason that they were able to stay in business was because of Cloudflare's protection against... Uh, internet denial of service attacks. And the CEO woke up one day and, and was annoyed that they were claiming that Cloudflare was protecting them and decided to ban them from Cloudflare, effectively removing them from uh, the internet. Uh, and whatever you think about whether th that particular website should be online, that's an extraordinary power for a tech company to wield over whether somebody can speak online. Um, and there's a good argument that what Cloudflare does is even at a more basic level than what Facebook and, and Google do. Um, you know, Facebook can make a, a claim that it has a form it's trying to curate and, and it's unresolved, but there's a, you know, there's a real First Amendment argument that Facebook has to make. Cloudflare is operating at a, at a different level. Um, you know, they, they are literally the public square, um, you know, to extend the analogy. Um, but to get to your question, Jamal, I, I, my uh, instinct is that it's hard to draw firm conclusions just yet about how we should think about uh, technology's role in amplifying, you know, or, or, or making it easier for groups to organize. Because it is true that in Charlottesville, uh, it seemed to have made it much easier for those marchers to organize. Um, but it also makes it much easier for folks on the other side to organize counter protests. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the protest that took place a few weeks afterward in Boston is a good example, um, where you had, I think, a thousand to one. Um, uh, marchers, protesters against uh, the kind of white supremacist uh, movement, and that's an example, I think, of of more speech working. Now that you know that doesn't address, I think, a core concern of folks who who are worried about hate speech, which is that it's not just about uh, allowing. You know, the, the concern is not just that we, there won't be enough counter protesters. The concern is that hateful speech causes harm itself, uh, and uh, you know. Uh, I, I think we should all take that seriously. You know, I, I'm not a, there are some free speech advocates who um, minimize the harm of hate speech, and I think that's a mistake. Uh, you I, know, I, I think uh, hate speech can cause real harm, uh, and I think it's important to defend uh, the First Amendment in spite of the real harm that, that hate speech can cause. And so I think, it, so, you know, to wrap it up, I think it's unresolved how the role of technology plays, and we're, and we're learning, but I think it'll, it'll aid both sides. I was going to say, I really have not come across a supporter of the a free speech for hate speech who, do, who um, dismisses or, re, you know, overlooks or ignores or trivializes in any way the potential harm. And the reason I say potential, because when you're talking about um, immediate harm, I assume, in terms of psychic injury, um, many psycho social psychologists have written about this. It's kind of interesting because when uh, hate speech codes were originally pr uh, pr um, advocated in this country several decades ago, it was mostly lawyers who were debating it. In the meantime, I've discovered there's this whole interdisciplinary hate studies have, sad but true, emerged uh, on campuses and other venues around, around, the, around the country, certainly perhaps around the world. And social scientists are saying, yes, of course, we all have had experiences with, with speech, including hate speech, um, deeply distressing us, but there are ways that you can be educated and trained and counseled to be resilient 
to learn to make it an empowering experience rather than a traumatizing one. And to me, one of the most positive aspects of all the ferment on campus, which does have some of its downsides too, uh, but the positive is that you're seeing so many students, including minority students, standing up for their rights and, and speaking up. And they're certainly not being silenced by what they perceive to be hate speech and even hate crimes, and that's positive. I sometimes wish that they weren't using their speech rights to drown out other people, uh, but I think it's encouraging that they still have, have faith in their uh, power to organize and, and try to uh, improve the system. So I, I'll go ahead. I, I think one small point I think is worth saying, um, you know, uh, it may be the case, and this is, might be one concern that um, uh, those sorts of campus protesters have is that the, those who have the political clout to stand up and respond, that may not be an equally distributed ability. Um, and so it may, it may be possible for some folks on campuses, you know, at, you know, universities to stand up and protest against hateful speech. Maybe uh, you have less of an ability to do so if you live in a, a town where uh, your point of view, your cultural experience you know, is much more marginalized. And there is, so there is an unequal distribution of the ability to counter protest. And I think that's kind of relevant to the conversation. It doesn't change my ultimate conclusion about um, uh, the need to resist regulation of hate speech, but I think it's, um, it's not a total answer. Uh, you know, the counter protest isn't a total answer to some people in the conversation. Except that society has a responsibility to provide education and resources and access to technology. I couldn't agree with you more. And that, to me, is a positive role that government could yeah. have. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to ask a uh, I want to ask a, a final question of me, though it actually does overlap with one of the many many questions that the audience uh, submitted, uh, which is uh, about uh, something else that's exceptionally American, which is guns. Uh, so Charlottesville. Uh, obviously involved uh, not just uh, freedom of speech and hate speech, but the carrying of, of guns in a state in which uh, open carry was permitted. Uh, there's one question that one might ask, and there's a number of different questions one could ask about the relationship between, um, between assembly and speech and the carrying of weapons. Uh, but if you are a jurisdiction that allows open carry, uh, there actually are a number of such jurisdictions that further say you cannot open carry at a demonstration. Uh, and they're, they're from, from one perspective, from a sort of robust free speech perspective, you might say, well, that's, that's actually problematic uh, because that is suggesting that only when there's some expressive content um, do we say that you can't open carry guns. You can carry them if you're just going to the store or going to the, the bar, but you can't carry them when you have a message to send. Uh, is that a problem? Uh, from a free speech perspective? I don't think so. I think that that is common sense uh, and <laughs> just trying to avoid a problem. One of the uh, phrases, I think, in the discussion about harm that hate speech causes doesn't capture everything that's involved. Part of it is the emotional reaction that some of the hate speech causes to result in physical response. Um, we saw it in Charlottesville. Uh, we can imagine many other situations. If you say something, and it, it slides into the fighting words uh, situation, if you say something that is so personally insulting or insulting to your group and brings back horrible, scarring memories of what happened to your ancestors or your family, um, it may be too much to say to someone, well, just ignore it, move on, uh, don't react. Uh, the, um, the hurt is too deep, and uh, society has some responsibility uh, to prevent riot and um, uh, violence. And I think um, the issue with the guns is a perfect example of that. Uh, just you want to demonstrate, don't bring guns. It seems to me the answer to your question is that it's not a First Amendment issue. It is a Second Amendment question, but not a First Amendment question. Uh, I don't think it violates the First Amendment to say that you know guns shouldn't be here or there. Indeed, if if the theory of uh, 
not having them is that it empowers speech or that having them around de depresses speech. That's a, you know, that's a First Amendment side of it, but it, it is that part, I, I think, of your question is uh, essentially a, a Second Amendment issue as to whether it violates it or not to require what would otherwise be open carry not to be in certain circumstances. Well, I think Thank it you, Justice Scalia. I think it does raise a, a First Amendment issue because it is at least symbolic expression, right? Uh, and the ACLU, apparently, I, I've been told this way before my time there, uh, defended the right of Black Panthers to demonstrate with guns. That was a controversial position. Uh, more recently, in the wake of Charlottesville, the ACLU's executive director has been quoted as saying that uh, the organization either would not defend First Amendment rights of people who are carrying guns or at the very least take a much harder look at whether one of the emergency type exceptions to freedom of speech uh, applies. And speaking for myself, I have to say, uh, if I imagine myself facing demonstrators who are armed, it would definitely have an intimidating impact on me. It would chill my First Amendment rights. I probably would not stay there and engage in counter protest. Uh, it would impair my freedom of movement by, by chasing me away. And, and I don't mean to be so personal about it. The, the legal test for intimidation or a so-called true threat is um, if the speaker means to instill a reasonable fear uh, that the person is uh, targeted is going to be subject to harm. And reasonable means uh, it's an objective standard, not a subjective standard. But it seems to me facing at least a group of armed protesters uh, could well be considered to be a true threat and therefore not protected by the First Amendment. Yeah, just, uh, just to clarify my, my own position on this, it was that saying that in an open carry stake, state in certain circumstances, the carrying can't be open, in my view, does not violate the First Amendment. Do I think that open carrying in some circumstances may uh, uh, threaten First Amendment rights? Sure. And there, you could have a, a conflict between people at least arguing on the basis of different constitutional amendments. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to turn to some of the audience questions. There are lots of them and lots of great uh, questions. Uh, but I wanted to, I wanted to um, single out a couple of people asked about something that Alex brought up earlier, which is, uh, which is campus speech. Uh, and uh, I'll just state one of the questions as asked, which is what obligation do public universities have to host speakers uh, can, can they decline based on the speaker's inability to fill the auditorium or based on security cost, or I will add, based on a kind of heckler's veto theory or a theory that uh, they might cause distress to students uh, on campus. Uh, and one could, the, the questions have been asked about public universities, but one could, um, could, could expand it in the way we have on this panel to talk about private universities as well. Uh, since you brought it up, maybe. Sure, I, yeah, my, my, my instinct is that, um, Universities certainly don't have to allow their students to invite speakers, which is how most of the campus controversies arise, is that one group invites a speaker that other groups don't like. Universities don't have to have that kind of a policy. I think it's, better, I think it's generally better for universities to, you know, for pedagogical purposes, allow student groups to invite speakers. And I think once they do, then as public universities, they have an obligation to act even-handedly. Uh, and... Uh, uh, you know, not to uh, slide viewpoint discrimination through the back door by um, uh, overstating security risks or um, under-investing in, you know, the common protections against disruptive, um, you know, uh, security events. Uh, so that's my own view, is that if, if, you, if they open up that forum, then they have an obligation to defend it in an even-handed manner. I agree. Well, let me, let me uh, make a more provocative addendum then, which is to say 
that under U.S. law and under U.S. law and the U.S. constitutional law in the context of affirmative action, um, the court, Supreme Court has suggested that universities have some, uh, some control, can, can control the, uh, the expressive space of the university through their admissions policies, mm -hmm. right? So that, so that what would ordinarily not be allowed is public institution says, you have this view and so I, I will uh, admit you and not you uh, because you have a different view. You, can, you actually can do that in the context of admissions. And so you're, all, you're already in a space in which you're allowing universities to construct the expressive space. Uh, so if that's the case, then why not go further and to say they can also decide that certain speakers are allowed and other speakers are not? I would say purely from, I mean, even putting aside the First Amendment and free speech and academic freedom concerns, I would say as a professional educator uh, and a full-time activist in both capacities that you would be disserving that student body, especially one that is trying to embrace uh, historically disempowered and marginalized individuals if you deny them the educational opportunity of encountering ideas that they consider deeply loathsome. And I don't want to speak for myself. I'll quote Barack Obama. He was fabulous on this issue on campus after campus, including in his uh, last two commencement addresses, one of which was at Howard University, and he exhorted the students. He said, yeah, it, it is going to be painful to minority students, but guess what? You're, I, I hate to disillusion you, but you're going to be facing hate, hateful speech every day for the rest of your life when you get out of here. And the best way to prepare yourself is now. Take advantage of this opportunity. And then he also talked about the civil rights movement and that the way it succeeded was encountering the ideas of the opponents and, and learning how to respond to them. And other uh, African American and other minority activists are going around campus making this same point that um, somehow we're not doing any good either for psychologists say for the uh, for the mental well-being of these students and and certainly not for the social justice and racial justice causes that they're espousing. You, you also don't have to go to listen to a speaker you don't agree with. You can simply not attend. That's one way of expressing your view of it. I'll, I'll move on to, the, uh, to another question from the audience. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll state the question as, as written, and I'll add a little bit of a gloss onto it, which is, how can the First Amendment adapt to a media environment in which the abundance of speech, the democratization and amplification, and the scarcity of attention is increasingly deployed as a method of censorship. Uh, so another way of asking the question would be to say, is there, speech is cheap, uh, it's abundant. Uh, is there a point at which there is so much speech that we worry about its abundance actually harming First Amendment values? Well, as Mae West said, too much of a good thing is an even better thing. <laughs> I mean, if the point of the question is, does, does the availability of, the, the, the easy availability of more speech and more speech and more speech run significant risks, well, yes, it does. I mean, that's how terrorists get together. That's how Nazis get together. That's how child pornographers get together. I mean, there's a price tag for all of this stuff. Uh, um, and, and there's a price tag for the new technology, which makes it all as easy as just a click. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't limit it, uh, heaven knows, but, uh, but I think we should acknowledge there are serious social costs. I think the, the response, and there was actually a report was just put out earlier this week by Penn, the First Amendment Writers Organization, on fake news. Uh, and, and it was a point that was raised in a different context by Alex about uh, people who might not have the resources or the wherewithal to respond to, to hate speech. I think we have such an imperative responsibility as a society starting, I mean, way before campus, we have to start with pre K, right, uh, in instilling critical media viewing skills 
skills to learn to sort the wheat from the chaff, the fake news from the real news, the, uh, to help people process in the most healthy way for their uh, psychological well-being speech that may be personally painful to them. So I think there are actually two kind of components to this question, and one I think is primarily what uh, Nadine and Floyd were responding to, which is to the extent that new technology allows people to express themselves uh, more frequently, more fully, more vocally, you know, in different colors and emojis, is that a problem for the First Amendment, or do we just need to come up with new tools for, uh, you know, figuring out how to prioritize uh, which of our friends' tweets and Facebook posts we read? I think that's one side of the question. The other side, which is, I, I took the question to be more directed at, but this is in part because, uh, you know, at the Knight Institute, we recently published a piece by Tim Wu that asks this very question. Uh, the piece is entitled, Is the First Amendment Obsolete? And I encourage you to read it. His question is, uh, uh, now we have a world in which uh, so many speakers aren't real speakers. There are bots that are deployed by foreign adversaries. Um, in, for, in, you know, in some countries, governments themselves use bots to flood protest movements so that those protest movements don't have an opportunity to get their message out. Um, and you might think that that kind of a speech is a different, a different sort of speech than they're just being a cacophony of real speakers. You know, these are kind of deliberately targeted attacks using automated bot networks that you know, violate the terms of service of all of these social media companies, but have the effect of distorting in a different sort of way, I think, the speech environment that those uh, social media <coughs> companies have created. I think, you know, I think that is a problem. I don't know what the right way of addressing it is. I think there might be um, ways to uh, regulate around the margins that don't actually implicate the sort of speech we care about uh, and only implicate these sorts of violations of terms of service of the companies. Um, the line between the two might be difficult to find, and I, I'd be very worried about not, you know, uh, passing from one to the other. Um, but I, I think that's a second component to the question um, that, that this person may have been getting at. Uh, yeah, so there's, a, there's a, and there's, there's just to amplify just a little bit, one way of understanding the question is that the First Amendment protects not only speakers but also listeners. Mm -hmm. And to the degree uh, listeners' interests are being um, compromised by... Uh, by the flood of information, uh, in some ways, that's the one could one could even put it in the la in the language in the constitutional language of freedom of the press, for example. So the pr part of the purpose of a press is to act as an intermediary between speakers and listeners. And so, if that is completely diffuse, uh, then th one has to decide what the value of having freedom in this domain is. And so, is it really protecting the receipt the recipient of information, or is it protecting the ability of someone to express themselves? Modern, you know, modern free speech cases, I think, over the next 20, 30 years are more frequently than in the past going to pit First Amendment interests against First Amendment interests. And, mm -hmm. you know, the cases of the, the seminal cases of the 50s and 60s were uh, easy in one sense, in which there was a First Amendment interest on one side and the government on the other. And, you know, so if we accept that one of the primary purposes of the First Amendment was to keep government out of the business of regulating speech. Those cases were easy conceptually. Now, more and more, you're going to have First Amendment interests on both sides. And it's interesting that, you know, historically, if you look at free speech thought, speaker interests were not the predominant concern of most free speech theorists. You know, the, the kind of progenitors of the American vision of free speech were Milton and, and Mill, both of whom were probably far more focused on listener interests, on the kind of, you know, consequentialist results of having, um, you know, free speech out there for consumers of speech to take it, discover truth, make better policy decisions. You know, the kind of more speaker-focused uh, uh, vision emerged in this country really only in the, you know, in the, the dissents in the 20s and then the majority opinions uh, in the 50s and 60s, um, and how to resolve that conflict in the future as those interests increasingly are pitted against each other in uh, the context of you know, modern free speech cases, I think is a real challenge. I mean, let's be clear. When we talk about First Amendment interests, we are generally talking about what I would call the spirit of the First Amendment, not, not the First Amendment as a barrier to government control over mm -hmm. speech. Uh, it may well be that the profusion of voices and the ease with which uh, uh, entities can uh, almost kidnap public opinion uh, on one subject uh, or another disturbs the public. 
and ultimately deserves it in a very serious way. That doesn't make it a First Amendment problem. There are other things than the First Amendment. Uh, I, may, I mean it. Uh, 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 but but I, I mean, I, I think we ought to be careful not to overuse the words First Amendment. We have, it, it would be a very serious thing indeed if uh, uh, one entity, for example, were to have so much, but one private entity would have so much power uh, that it was basically the controller of speech in the world. We may be moving towards that. Uh, uh, I, I, I wouldn't use the words, that's a First Amendment problem, that's a cataclysmic, terrible uh, uh, problem. But I, I think it's dangerous to use the word First Amendment almost as a metaphor. Uh, uh, I mean, we, we ought to think about it, especially in a room like this. I mean, the First Amendment is law. I mean, it's very important that it's written down, it's very important that it's enforced, it's very important that we focus on what it is and what it isn't. And that shouldn't keep us from, from observing and being concerned about and trying to deal with uh, the problems which have nothing to do with government. I mean, th there could come a time in which Facebook would be so threatening by its success, assuming it does nothing wrong that, that we would criticize it for, but so powerful that whether under the antitrust laws or some new sort of legislation, that whoever is in power might try to deal with it in some way. Uh, and if that power is not a governmental power, if it is, for example, public opinion, which shames them, or people picket, et cetera. Yeah, the picketing is protected by the First Amendment, but not everything is the core of the First Amendment. Yeah, and to, I mean, to that point, to the extent we're not really talking strictly First Amendment, but we're just talking spirit of First Amendment, and we're talking about entities that are private entities. I mean, there are other remedies, like anti-discrimination laws in, for public accommodations, if they are entities that could be considered public accommodations with certain jurisdictions, to the extent that they are declining to, uh, to carry information or services or speech for certain groups or, or individuals, whether it's specifically to those individuals or there's a disparate impact on specific groups of people. That could also be a remedy well, one could seek a remedy under anti-discrimination protections. Uh, if let, I, me, let me ask yeah. a final uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, ask a final uh, question, and there are a number of questions. Uh, we've managed uh, so far to not talk about the president, um, uh, but I'm going to ask a final question about the president. A number of people have asked uh, in, on, on their cards various questions um, implicating his behavior. Uh, and so I, I guess the, the question I'll just put to the panel is, have there, we've talked about government speech, uh, but have there been uh, actions taken by this president that, uh, that violate the First Amendment? Uh, and that's whether uh, we're talking about threatening the licenses of media companies, um, threatening the NFL with a boycott, uh, uh, limiting or attacking, limiting media access to his own actions or the actions of his administration, uh, attacking the media in other ways, blocking people on Twitter, uh, and so forth. Uh, and th that'll be your kind of final lightning round question. Well, the Knight Institute is suing him on one of those, so we should hear about that. Yeah, this, is a, this is a softball. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to start. Yeah, we, we, we're, we have a lawsuit challenging the president's blocking of critics on Twitter, arguing that the way he uses his Twitter account has converted it effectively into uh, uh, a, a, an instrument of government, uh, of government and of government policymaking, uh, and is a area in which citizens engage with the president, engage with one another about his policies through the responses to his Twitter posts. Um, and we've argued that for that reason, it has become a, a public forum, a designated or a limited public forum from which he cannot exclude people on the basis of their viewpoint. Uh, and we are now you know, in the middle of briefing that question in the district court. Uh, but you know, th that's the, the low hanging fruit for me, I suppose, is yes. 
<laughs> but you know, some of the other examples that you gave Jamal, and I and I think I completely uh, agree with the the theory of the Knight Institute's lawsuit, and we're seeing politicians around the country uh, really using what are, in some formal sense, their private social media platforms, but really as their main way of communicating with their constituents and allowing their constituents to communicate with each other. So it, for practical purposes, and I think the analysis should be a practical functional one, uh, they're being denied their equal rights as citizens as well as their free speech rights if they're blocked from these social media platforms. So it's a very, very important issue. But some of the other examples that you gave uh, Jamal, go back to this issue we were talking about earlier of um, trying to distinguish different capacities in which government officials are speaking or facilitating speech. Uh, and for Trump, the question would be to what extent is he just expressing his views as an individual who happens to be president of the United States and does not forfeit his First Amendment rights, I would contend, as the vir as, you know, the, uh, by virtue of the fact that he's president. But at what point is, is there some power, some threatening power that could constitute an abridgment of free speech? If the president says, uh, we ought to investigate whether licenses should be taken away from NBC, in a way that is a mixed question of fact and law. Should NBC see that as a threat? Is it something that's going to chill its speech or alter the way in which it uh, carries out its speech? If so, then that is a First Amendment problem. But if it's taken just as hyperbole today, he's saying this, tomorrow he's saying that, and it doesn't really have an abridging or chilling impact, then he's just exercising his own free speech rights. It seems to me that uh the president is going through a checklist. How many different proposals can I make, mm. which, and if adopted, would violate the First Amendment? <laughs> uh, uh, so whether it's libel law or confidential sources, which he has said shouldn't be allowed, or flag burning, which he has said people ought to go to jail for a year and lose their citizenship, uh, and I could go down a longer list, uh, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a good high school exam. <laughs> uh, uh, but that said, for, for, for me at this point, the worst things that he has done from a First Amendment perspective uh, is the war on the press, the daily denigration of the press, uh, the, the effort to uh, persuade uh, the, the public to simply disregard the, uh, the, the press, even when it's right, and very often, and I, I really don't say this as a partisan, but very often in the context of him having said things that were not true, and which are then exposed by the press, and as to which he, he denounces them as if there were no such thing as objective truth or falsity about facts, not opinions, facts. And that, that I think, is, is dangerous uh, and, and can, can have, a, a particularly on a cumulative basis, uh, a very troubling impact on our society. Uh, for the rest, uh, you know, we will see which of the checklist uh, he or his attorney general tries to bring to uh, fruition. The NBC one, finally, for me, uh, is very, very troubling. When, when you start talking about license revocation, well, whatever you know or don't know as president about how the FCC works and, and that a network doesn't even have a license and CNN doesn't have a license because it's cable, you know, you're still talking about capital punishment. I mean, that, that's the topic. Shall we shut them up completely as a society? Uh, and, and that's a very dangerous road to start uh, walking down. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panel. <laughs> so what